Chapter 15. A Final Attack. Our company was spared from the heavy fighting that 21. Panzer Division was going through at the end of July 1944. Because of recent losses, battalion command did not judge us ready for action. As such, the by now less than 40 soldiers of our company first marched east in early August, before joining up with the rest of the battalion in the Lassie area, in the morning of August 5th. On the march back, I saw some of our own fighter planes fly towards the enemy. At first, we suspected them to be Allied attack aircraft, and immediately drove our vehicles off the road, but then identified them as German Messerschmitt BF-109 fighters. Flying low, they zoomed over the French fields. Our men cheered and waved at their pilots. Under the plane's fuselages, we thought to have seen bombs, but when they returned some time later with the same bombs still affixed, we realised that these had to be external fuel tanks. Well, in that case, we have to make do with our own hand grenades, one of my men remarked contritely. I knew nothing to say in reply. When we arrived at the regiment, we were appalled by the state we found our fellow soldiers in. All of them were at the end of their ropes. The unrelenting and constant fighting had worn all of them down. The Americans had broken out of their beachhead at Avranches and were standing close to Le Mans in the south, deep in our left flank. It seemed that nobody was stopping them. Our front line essentially ran over multiple hills north and south of Lassie. The highest peak at 1200 Fantivt, Montpanson, northeast of Lassie, had been one of the targets of the British's latest offence. A few days prior, they had begun an energetic push southward. This meant that their offensive line ran in parallel to our positions making it perfectly obvious that their attack was to support the American advance. At the time, we were situated very close to Montpensant, which itself was defended by units of 276, Infantry Division. Beginning on August 5th, the British attempted to capture the hill. In addition, most likely to keep 21. Panzer Division, from rushing to the embattled 276. Division's aid, our own positions were also fiercely attacked by British and Canadian troops taking or holding the vital peaks, was the main objective of both sides. He who has the height has the depths, is what we had been told back at Winsdorf Panzer Forces Academy, and it universally applied to all forces in this conflict. Immediately after our arrival in the Lassie area, I was asked to report to the regiment's commander. Upon entering his office, I was quite surprised to find our division commander, Major General Feuchtinger, standing before me. I saluted, which the general acknowledged with a nod before gesturing towards my regimental commander with a smile. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch nodded as well and informed me that we had suffered high casualties among the commanding personnel up to that point. He now needed every officer available to lead his subordinate units. Officers like me, who were relatively senior, now had to take extraordinary efforts. After all, I had been in action since the very first day of the invasion. Over the course of these harsh weeks of privation, I had gained a good reputation, and consequently, I was now to take command of one of the Panzer Grenadier companies that had become leaderless. On top of that, I was informed that a counterattack by our division on the enemy positions at Montpensant, as well as further west at Origny, was planned for the next day, August 6, 1944. This battle group of Mini was also to be supported by several of our armoured vehicles. Once the colonel finished, Major General Feuchtinger began to speak. Well, Lieutenant, I was informed that you are a capable man, so I want you to execute this attack with all of your vigour. Do not waste any time. Bring your battle group forward and beat back the enemy. I want your attack to be successful. Do you understand? He said insistently. I replied, Yes, General, sir, to which he nodded affirmingly. Good, Hola, then you are hereby dismissed, he finished. I signed off and was shown the way to the soldiers of my new Panzer Grenadier company. On the way, I had to think about the general's speech. On the one hand, I felt honoured, but on the other, I could feel the pressure that was now resting on me. Leading a battle group was quite a lot of responsibility for a mere lieutenant. Today, I know that Major General Feuchtinger was hard-pressed himself at that time. There was even the possibility that he could have been relieved of command. 
his absence on the first day of the landings had not been overlooked among his superiors. Although he had been just promoted to Major General on August 1st, this perhaps had been done in order to convey that impressive results were expected in return. Today, I cannot help but believe that the General was dealing with me personally only because he was in dire need of some success to point to. In this, he probably did not care in the slightest who and how many were sent to the slaughter. My Panzergrenadier company, in essence, comprised around 60 soldiers, who were all obviously more than battle-weary. When I assembled the company's NCOs to introduce myself and explain next day's mission to them, I could see in their faces how they were anything but enthusiastic about the prospect. Nevertheless, they listened attentively. After all, all of our lives were at stake. As had been promised, a mixed platoon of Panzer IV and Panzer V, Panther tanks of Panzer Regiment 22, showed up in the evening hours. I briefly conferred with the tank platoon commander, a young sergeant, before lying down with a queasy feeling at midnight to try and get a few hours of sleep. I could not catch any, however. Too many memories of my first assault in Tunisia came to my mind. What will tomorrow bring? I kept asking myself. If things were to go down like in Tunisia, we would have to walk through hell. Back then, I had commanded a platoon of almost 40 men. Now it was a company, but with its 60 soldiers, it was barely larger than my old platoon. Around Otusa in the night, we marched to our staging area, which we arrived at without any incidents. Shortly before our attack was planned to commence, things suddenly came thick and fast. Battle noise emerged ahead of us, and after a few minutes a runner came rushing in. The British had preempted our attack, going on the offence from the west and north towards Montpensant and the surrounding hills. We were now ordered to immediately advance towards the enemy. We went on the march towards Origny. Our staging area was located in an open forest southeast of the town, which ran up a hill slope. The crest was covered in trees and bushes, with some boulders visible between them. Through the binoculars we spotted soldiers up there breaking branches off the trees. We could not clearly identify them, but since good camouflage had by now become necessary for our survival, we assumed them to be German troops. We passed by Oridny without further incidents and eventually ended up west of the hill. I conferred with the tank commander about how we should advance through the terrain ahead. To get a better view, we went up to a nearby road. Suddenly, we heard engine noise ahead. Before we knew it, a German Kubelwagen came around the corner and stopped right next to us, in which sat a sergeant and a corporal who identified themselves as members of one of our infantry divisions. With the engine still running, they explained that they were stragglers looking for their home unit. We in turn explained our mission to them, and before we knew it, they turned around their car and drove off in the direction they had come from. The tank commander and I looked at each other, puzzled. But just as the Kubelwagen had disappeared behind the corner, a British armoured scout car suddenly emerged from it. The green and yellow striped vehicle came to a halt, its engine humming, and turned its turret towards us menacingly. All of this happened so fast that we were completely surprised. The distance to the British Humber scout car was almost 500 f. Before we could even drop into the roadside ditch, it opened fire on us. Its salvo came up short, however, the heavy machine gun bullets hitting the road before our feet. Now, off we go, both of us thought as we jumped into the ditch. But apparently, the British were also unpleasantly surprised to have encountered us as the scout car's engine revved up and it reversed back out of sight. All this had only taken a few seconds. With our hearts pounding, we retreated returning to our soldiers panting, but unharmed. I now ordered the grenadiers to march ahead in a widespread line, followed by the tanks which lumbered forward through the terrain with gunning engines. In case of enemy fire, the tanks had orders to immediately suppress any enemy positions identified. The morning mist had vanished and the sun rose up. Everyone kept searching the sky nervously. The woodland ended. We reached open ground with a small house on the edge. Then I gave the order to halt. I was walking roughly in the center of my battle group, immediately next to a Panzer IV. The tank had already left the woodland and was now covering the slope before it with its cannon. Just as I wanted to raise my hand, I heard the characteristic hum of aircraft engines ahead. 
Everyone winced, heads quickly turning in all directions. A moment later, we spotted the enemy attack aircraft approaching low over the horizon. Jabos, short for Jag Bomber, meaning fighter bombers. A soldier next to me shouted at the top of his voice, Full cover! All tried to disappear from the scene. Some of the grenadiers around me ran up to the tank and threw themselves under it. I wanted to join them, but hesitated for a moment and then sprinted towards the house, where I dropped down next to the wall. A shadow passed over me, followed by a howl and an enormous detonation. As if in slow motion, I witnessed a bomb hitting the Panzer A4, tearing it apart in a mighty explosion. In horror, I had to think about its crew and the grenadiers who had taken shelter under the tank. All were now expecting another bombing run, but to our surprise, this had been the only attack by these fighter bombers. For the next couple minutes, they devoted themselves to the area in our rear. As we would later find out, regimental command would come under attack and take a hammering. After we had recovered from the shock, we began advancing again. We left behind the smoking wreckage of the tank, whose turret had been flung several yards away by the force of the blast. The crew of five as well as five grenadiers were left behind dead. We turned to the right again, succeeding in taking the next hill without any further air attacks. We were met by some small arms fire, but managed to force the British infantry back. From the rear, we then got the order to hold position on the hill until further notice. I made the men prepare for the defence and cover up the tanks in all haste. Now we were safe for the moment. By the end of the day, however, the British had managed to capture a Mont Pinson east of our position. With that, the enemy had the area's highest peak in their hands, their flank was secured, and their objective met. In other areas, advancing British units had been successfully delayed by efforts of our artillery. In addition to the assault on Mont Pinson, the British also tried their luck on the point where our 21 Panzer Division was joined to 326 Infantry Division, this time with suitable artillery preparations. But despite the intense bombardment, our troops managed to repulse all British attacks until the evening as well as stabilize the old front line north of Lassie again. In the night, however, long, intense enemy artillery fire resumed. Under the flashing lights of exploding shells, we dug deep into the ground and pressed ourselves down in our foxholes. All around us, shells kept ploughing up the landscape. First reports of casualties came in. Luckily, all of them could be treated by the medics for the time being. During the night, I lost contact with the regiment. It became apparent that me and my battle group would not be able to hold this position for much longer. My tanks had withdrawn due to the fierce artillery fire, leaving us alone on the hill. Nobody wanted to run around in the bombardment, and so I resolved to take two of my runners and rush back myself, hoping to re-establish communications with the regiment. Again we ended up in the middle of a British artillery barrage, but by jumping from one ditch into the next like hares, we escaped it just as well. Finally we found another runner. The man told me that the regiment's latest attack had failed too, after which our right flank had collapsed. Regimental command had then issued a general order to withdraw. I now tried to hurry back to my company with my two runners. After a short time, one of my NCOs already crossed our way. He had a shrapnel wound in his upper leg, which was bleeding profusely. I yelled into his ear to go back. He looked at me, his eyes opened wide gazing at me bewildered, and kept lurching on towards the rear. We left him behind and kept running forward. The artillery fire ceased, and everything went quiet. We stood at the foot of the hill and looked up. Suddenly we heard combat noise and English shouts ahead. The British were already close by and had commenced their assault. Seconds later, the first bullets whizzed by around us. Everyone took cover wherever they could. I ran across a road and jumped into a field. Again, I heard voices. I squatted down on the ground, as there were obviously British on the road closing in. My company's positions on the hill must have been overrun already, I thought. I rolled to the side and entered a small depression which, as it turned out to my dismay, harboured a swampy pond. Within a moment, I had sunk into the mud up to my breast. The English-speaking voices grew louder and so I froze in the exact position I had entered the mire. 
I could feel the swamp water quickly soaking my clothes. Once the British had apparently passed me by, I immediately tried to free myself from this awkward situation. I managed to roll out of the mire, exhausted and covered in mud from head to toe, I crawled into a bush. My gun and camera were left behind in the gargling swamp. Over the sound of my pounding heart, I could hear another British scouting party marching past on the road. Once the British had passed by, I started running in the direction of my company. After some time I found another NCO, who had also been separated from our unit. When he spotted me coming towards him, completely covered in mud, he stopped and looked at me blankly. Only once I told him my name did he recognize me. We first took cover in a ditch. He told me that our company, or rather what was left of it, had retreated on its own after the British assault. We kept on walking and together managed to find our way back to the regiment. The staff there had already thought us to be missing in action. Until evening, some more additional soldiers trickled in. We spent the whole night trying to find our remaining men. In the morning, we finally gave up. I was completely exhausted. I had gone three days without sleep, and my little excursion into the mire had almost been the final straw. With my uniform soiled by dry mud, I must have been a terrible sight to behold. When I eventually assembled the remains of my Panzergrenadier company in the morning of August 8th, I counted two NCOs and 14 other soldiers. No more than 16 men were left of the almost 60 with whom I had headed out. My company was virtually wiped out. Together with these soldiers, I reported back at the regimental command post to Lieutenant Colonel Rauk. He was surprised to see me again, but immediately offered friendly greetings. He was quite elated, and I quickly saw why. He had been awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his actions at the Normandy front. Rauch told me that, although our attack did not result in a breakthrough, the front line had been successfully stabilized. His adjutant, First Lieutenant Ackerman, had been killed in the fighting, a fact which I was shocked to hear since I had only become acquainted to him a few days ago. Ackerman had also embarked on a special mission similar to mine. Unlike me, he had joined the long list of lives lost in the merciless fighting. I also received the news that our division commander, Major General Feuchtinger, had been awarded the Knight's Cross as well. He had received it already on August 6, 1944, the day of our advance on Mont Pinson. Apparently his division's attack that we carried out had yielded the desired result, even though this successful attack might perhaps not have been the sole reason for Feuchtinger to be awarded his Knight's Cross. As I was now standing before Lieutenant Colonel Rauch completely exhausted, I realized that the cross was apparently awarded not only for one's own personal acts of bravery. This was, however, what National Socialist propaganda always told us the award was for. Of course, I was aware that higher commanders were also awarded the Knight's Cross for their efforts. I have to say, however, that neither Feuchtinger nor Rauch had struck me as energetic military commanders. Feuchtinger, in particular, was always a controversial figure. Many rumours made the rounds among us officers about him and the women. And in addition, we had not forgotten about his absence during the first hours of the invasion. But he was also known for his close ties to Hitler, which traced back all the way to the 1930s Nuremberg rallies. As for Rauch, on the other hand, I definitely regarded him to be a fair and responsible commander, but most of the time, I could only find him with his staff far behind the front line. To be fair, my views about the whole situation might be a result of my subordinate perspective. It was just that at a time where I had just returned from a difficult and bloody mission, where I had lost almost all of my company, I had a hard time accepting the awards my superiors had received as something they truly deserved. I realized that in wartime, each individual order could be awarded for its own unique reasons, and bravery was just one of them. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch expressed his appreciation for my efforts. Lieutenant Hurler, you're going to make it far, he told me. In the same breath, he ordered me to get some rest. On the loss of my company, he did not elaborate. What was left of it was integrated into another. I went to clean myself and my uniform as well as I could and looked for a place to sleep. In the very moment I had found a cot and laid down, I was already gone. Almost fifteen hours later I was roused and received orders to report back with eight. Company. 
Still weary, I went on my way. Chapter 16 Hell in the Fillet's Pocket I arrived at Lassie in the evening of August 8th, where I reported to First Lieutenant Bratz. Our company was to repel the British armoured formations advancing southward. We found good positions in and around the village, and immediately began shelling the previously reconnoitred British positions, which were roughly two miles west of Lassie, with our grenade launchers. My two self-propelled guns covered the main line of movement westward. They drove into house walls in reverse and nestled into the buildings, thus creating well-concealed defensive positions. Not a very considerate course of action, but in this situation we had to take any measure necessary to improve our chances of survival. In the early hours, our forward posts had reported advancing tanks, and a moment later everyone was lying in their dugouts. The British tanks only dared to close in on Lassie in a slow and deliberate manner. One of them was too bold, however, going forward directly on the road. My two self-propelled guns were in a favourable position, and at a distance of around a hundred yards, the crack of a cannon shot sounded. The British tank immediately came to a halt and started smoking. Luckily for its crew, it did not explode. The British managed to bail out and ran away. We watched the fleeing tankers without opening fire. After our successful kill, we allowed ourselves some time to inspect the enemy tank. While the vehicle itself was unusable, we were happy to find several crates of British provisions inside. A very welcome surprise, which amazed us with its high-quality food. Everyone got a part of this gift, and we delightfully ate up all of it. After this armoured advance, the British settled for repeated artillery strikes and infantry scouting parties for some time. During this, I lost a man from my platoon, who was caught in an artillery strike just as he was out to relieve himself. A piece of shrapnel put an end to his young life. We found him lying in a field with his trousers down. Apart from the lethal shrapnel wound, he had not a single scratch. Our division's mission was now to enable the movement eastward of five, Panzer Army's withdrawing formations. Like a stinger, our unit was the last protruding west into the Allied lines. Over the next couple of days, the British were battering us from three sides. Due to repeated artillery bombardments, we had three more casualties within a short time. All wounds were serious injuries caused by the shrapnel of explosive shells. These could cause horrible wounds, sever whole limbs with one blow or even rupture the lungs through their shockwaves. You were lucky to receive only light wounds. During a reconnaissance patrol of our near surroundings by one of our NCOs leading 10 to 12 men, they managed to capture three British soldiers from a scouting party. Interrogation did not result in any intelligence which we did not already possess, namely that we were once again in danger of becoming surrounded. It was high time to withdraw eastward. Since we had barely any manpower to spare for guarding our prisoners, we decided to send them back to their comrades after a short interrogation. We gave them a white sheet and told them to march westward along the main road. Visibly puzzled, but understandably relieved, they went away with their arms raised. Soon, enemy pressure on Lassie became too strong. There was a great danger of becoming surrounded. We found ourselves in the same situation we had been in before at Benouville and Mondeville. This time our battalion commander recognised the looming threat in time. In the following night, between August 11 and 12, our battalion withdrew roughly 1.2 miles eastward to St. Vega, where we took up a new defensive position. As support, we received a Panzer Grenadier company from the Battalion. It comprised a whopping 30 soldiers. That was not necessarily a staggering battle force. Our two companies formed a small battle group, which was tasked with covering our regiment's retreat westward. In the night before August 13, 21, Panzer Division withdrew onto a line between La Chapelle and La Roque. Our battalion was now the division's rearguard. As we were shifting more and more toward the east, our front became less and less coherent. German troops were streaming past us. All tried to escape into the east. Together with the leader of the Panzer Grenadier Company assigned to us, I decided to reconnoiter into the north. The situation around us was quickly becoming more chaotic, and we wanted to find out how far the enemy was away, or whether they had even overtaken us already. My plan was approved and so the two of us drove off in my Kubelwagen. Ahead of us on a hill, there was a large farmstead 
which could be seen from all directions. We wanted to have a closer look at it, as it appeared to be a good spot for looking over the area. We were also painfully aware, however, that this trip could end in our demise if the farmstead was already occupied by the enemy. We decided to not take any unnecessary risks during our reconnaissance. We left the Kubelwagen in the concealment of several bushes next to the road and kept going on foot. In addition, we left our submachine guns in the car and only took our pistols with us, which we kept holstered. If the British were to encounter us in such an unarmed state, we thought our chances better for them to not open fire on us immediately, but rather call out from a distance in the hopes of capturing us without a fight. We sneaked our way forward. Our nerves were strung to breaking point. A lone soldier with a submachine gun and loose trigger finger could have led to our demise. We trusted in our obviously displayed inferiority. With utmost tension, we reached the farmstead. We spotted a man, apparently the farmer, busying himself with clearing out his cattle's dung. Calm and placid, as if it was blissful peacetime and not August 1944. We slowly went closer to the farmer. When he saw us, he paused for a moment before leaning onto his pitchfork and staring at us. In an inquiring tone, I said, Anglaise? Non, he muttered sullenly before resuming his work. It was as clear as day that we were not welcome here. Perhaps he was irritated by still encountering German soldiers and not allied ones. We tried to get a look from the hill on the surrounding area. There were pillars of smoke rising from burning vehicles and buildings all around. We could also spot enemy aircraft far away. There was no unmistakable sign of advancing enemy forces. However, the situation was still not clear. We decided to go back again as moving forward even further would have been pointless. Back at the battle group, we reported our observations to our superior commanders, but the battalion could not give us any additional information about the situation around us either. Only one thing was clear. There would be no such thing as holding the line anymore. Whenever we caught sight of the Tommies, we would open fire and then withdraw to the next favourable position. Most of the time, it was British armoured scout cars rushing over the road, before halting for a moment to scan the area with their rotating turrets. One or two high-explosive rounds usually sufficed in ending such incautious activities. In one of these actions, one of my guns managed to light a British scout car on fire. The gun was in a good firing position. When the scout car slowly passed behind a wrecked German truck and closed in, it was already done for. A short order to fire and our first shell struck right on target. We watched from a safe distance as a few of the crew members bailed out and the armoured car eventually burned up completely. But these advances by the British were always followed closely by Allied fighter bombers, which then circled above us like vultures. During these times, we were effectively paralysed and each of us hoped that there were no British tanks following these scout cars. In that case, we would have been doomed, as the fighter bombers would have prevented us from withdrawing in time and we had nothing to withstand a massed armoured attack. Our two self-propelled guns would have only bought the shortest amount of time. Fortune was still on our side, however, and our small battle group kept up the slow fighting retreat towards the east. Some of the German formations around us were disintegrating completely, and time and again we had stragglers come in and join our ranks. Soldiers from the infantry divisions were most often appearing especially distraught, some of them just sat down and could not be moved to march on with us. The relentless Allied attacks had brought them to the very end of their tether. There was nothing we could do for them. From August 16th, 1944 onward, it became apparent that there was a pocket forming around us in the Falaise area. Everyone now attempted to escape into the east. The once orderly retreat turned into chaotic flight. The infantry divisions were supplied almost entirely with horse-drawn vehicles and so we saw a multitude of carts congesting the roads. Between them walked the wounded and demoralised soldiers. Allied fighter-bomber attacks became more intense by the day, and everything around us descended into chaos, destruction and death. As for our own unit, we tried to make our withdrawal with leapfrog manoeuvres. My SPGs took a position and covered the Grenadier Company's movement. Then the latter was covering us, and we withdrew past its position. Then, one night, we lost communications with each other, and our eight. Company was now completely alone again. From August 17 to 18, 
the situation grew increasingly worse. The enemy kept attacking from fillets in the direction of Trun. This led to German panzer divisions standing in the west, becoming huddled into each other more and more. For them, the way east was not at all an easy one. They had to cross the River Orn on their retreat, behind which another obstacle awaited them, namely the River Dives. Masses of men and materiel were building up on and around the bridges. Allied aircraft and artillery were bombarding these concentrations constantly, making any form of progress almost completely impossible. Each formation now attempted to break out on its own. Every man was fighting for his immediate comrades and nothing else. Within our company, too, feelings of desperation became more prevalent. Fuel was almost impossible to get. The masses crowded the roads and vehicle after vehicle had to be left behind by ourselves as well. In the end, I only had my two self-propelled guns remaining. In the morning of August 19th, we were positioned roughly three miles west of St. Lambert. Runner communications with regimental command had ceased several days before. Judging from what reports we were getting over the course of the day, we concluded that the Allies must have managed to tighten the pocket to a few kilometres already, albeit only loosely we were in danger of getting cut off completely. Battalion Command now tasked me with re-establishing communications with our regimental command post south of Trone. It had to be somewhere a few miles behind us. To this end, I procured a motorcycle, which had been standing in the middle of the street, apparently left behind by its former owner. My men saw to it that its fuel tank was full, and shortly before dark set in, I set out alone. Wanting to avoid the congested roads as much as possible, I went across country at breakneck speed. Time and again I had to stop and orientate myself. What I witnessed was an inferno beyond any description. On the meadows around me were countless groups of soldiers, dozens at a time, either wounded or already dead. Between them lay dead horses, stood carriages, trucks, ambulances, guns, tanks or armoured cars. Many vehicles were ablaze, spewing oily smoke into the air. Sometime after nightfall, I eventually found our regiment's command post south of Train. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch appeared to be crestfallen. An advance by the Canadian 4th Armoured Division from Falaise towards Troon had split our division right in the middle. Our regiment stood south and southwest of the village of Troon and was in danger of being ultimately cut off by the next Canadian push southwards. The battle groups of 21. Panzer Division now had orders to attempt to break through into the east on their own. Battle Group von Luck, meaning Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, had commenced its breakout the day before, and Battle Group Opeln had followed that day, August 19th. Our own Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, Battle Group Rauch, was to begin its breakout attempt in the night before August 20th. The regimental command post was now hastily readied for the march. When I reported to Rauch and asked for further orders for his two battalion, he at first could not believe that I was actually standing before him. Hala! he exclaimed. Where in all the world did you come from? Rauch explained to me that he had already been informed that our battalion had been wiped out. Apparently one company had been mistaken for our whole battalion. Rauch now wanted to withdraw eastwards with the remains of his regiment as per his orders. He ordered me to drive back to my battalion and relay these orders immediately to Major Lenz. The new rallying point for Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192 was to be St. Lamba. There, the pocket was apparently not closed, and it seemed that breaking through was feasible on the road leading through this village, as well as another road through Chambois, further southeast. It was also obvious to me that now all of our forces wanted to escape along this route. Only the quickest ones would succeed, however. I jumped back on my motorcycle and drove to the battalion. I had trouble coming through. After a few miles, I ran out of gasoline. I kept going on the road on foot for a while. On an empty stretch where the road had a bend, a German Panzer I-4 came towards me at high speed. I saw that it was much too fast and had the presence of mind to leap off the street, landing next to the end of a sewer pipe below it. I hurried into the pipe and only moments later, the tank's tracks burrowed into the ditch right where I had just entered it. I crawled out of the pipe through its other end and looked at the panzer lying in the ditch at a tilt. 
the tank's commander climbed out of the turret hatch before starting to yell and gesture in the direction of the driver, obviously furious about having effectively lost his vehicle. I turned around and stumbled along on the road. After some time, I discovered an abandoned Kettenkrad standing on the roadside and drove on with it. I eventually arrived at the battalion. There, all hope had already been abandoned. Major Lentz had assembled all remaining officers around him. I reported to him, which he acknowledged stoically. It was apparent that an orderly retreat was barely possible amidst all this chaos. Nevertheless, he issued commands for all to rally at St. Lambert. We would attempt to initially break out together. In case any unit would get separated from the rest, however, each company commander was to try reaching St. Lambert with his remaining men on his own. The Major ordered me to take his adjutant, Lieutenant Schultzer, and drive ahead on the tracked motorcycle to reconnoitre the way towards St. Lambert. Since I was already familiar with the route, I was to take the lead. Major Lenz ordered the companies to arrange in a marching order. 8. Company with my two self-propelled guns was again tasked with forming a rearguard. I bade farewell to First Lieutenant Bratz. We wished each other godspeed, and together with his runner, he returned to our company on a sidecar motorcycle. Like with most men of our company, I would never see him again. Late in the evening of August 19, 1944, we went on the march to St. Lambert. The roads were completely covered in vehicles standing in two or three columns immediately next to each other. Many of these were burning or already wrecked. Artillery shells were striking continuously. Ammunition and fuel was exploding everywhere around. In the midst were streams of soldiers slowly making their way. Tanks were ablaze. Horses lay on their back, their legs thrashing about in their death throes. We came across ambulance cars which had burned up while they were full of wounded. Horribly mutilated, their charred corpses lay inside the wrecks and on the ground before it. After just a short time, Lieutenant Schulzer and I had already lost contact to our battalion. There was nothing to be done. All around us, the chaotic masses pushed onward. Eventually, we arrived at the centre of St. Lambert, where we found a command post that was apparently trying to coordinate the breakout. There, I saw something unforgettable. Two German generals sitting on crates right among all the bustle. We were told that they were commanders of two infantry divisions who had lost contact with their respective units. Both of the two SS Panzer Division's vanguards had already succeeded in breaking through towards Vimantias, and every man able to do so was following in their tracks. Since Lieutenant Schulze and I had no more contact with our battalion whatsoever, we decided to join up with 10. SS Panzer Division, Frunsberg. Its soldiers seemed to us to be still undeterred, and their vigorous demeanour looked promising when it came to making it out of the pocket. Just like our unit, 10. SS Panzer Division had arrived at St. Lambert in the morning hours of August 20th. In the afternoon, the breakout attempt was to be made, following the lead of the other two SS Panzer Divisions which had gone before. After more skirmishes with enemy tanks and anti-tank guns, we eventually arrived at the positions of 2 and 9. SS Panzer Divisions, 2nd, SS Panzer Corps, southwest of Vimoutier. After their successful breakout, these two divisions had commenced a counter-offensive which had contributed to our own breakout success in a considerable way. Thanks to their pressure, the attacks on us had remained limited in scopy. Completely exhausted, we now finally had a few hours of rest. It was hard to believe that we had actually managed to escape this hellscape of death and perdition. The tenseness of the days before now started to fade, and everyone, be they a humble soldier or proud general, was glad to have survived and to have made it through. Chapter 17 Retreat East After our successful escape, everyone hurried towards the River Seine. Back on August 21, 1944, Army Group B had ordered a general retreat behind this large stream. For the time being, we assembled what was left of our 21. Panzer Division between Bellu and Fervakes. Individual regiments were down to 30% of their original strength and had barely any heavy weaponry left. Lieutenant Schulzer and I asked our way and eventually found the rally point of our 192nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment. The regiment had been one of the last formations to escape the pocket, 
and had been weakened the most. Divisional command had thus given provisional orders to rally at Saint-Germain-la-Campagne and remain in reserve. When the lieutenant and I reported at the rally point, we were welcomed by Colonel Rauch. He had been promoted in the meantime. Visibly glad to see us, Rauch quickly briefed us on the general situation. It did not look all too well. The losses suffered inside the pocket were neither quantifiable nor even conceivable. The next big problem was that now the entirety of Army Group B had to cross the Seine. Our regimental staff had been decimated during the fighting retreat. I was the only lieutenant to have been part of the regiment right from the beginning of the Normandy landings. Some of the other subaltern positions had to be replaced up to seven times. Colonel Rauch made a surprisingly long time for me. After he had dismissed Schulze, he asked me to sit down for a moment. Hola, he commenced his address in his characteristic fatherly tone. I already know you since 1943. I always saw you as a very capable, industrious, and, most of all, courageous officer. So, what would you say if you were to switch from a career as reserve officer to active officer duty? I was staggered. I had not expected that. In the time during and shortly after the breakout, I had gotten the chance to think about many things. We had escaped along with the soldiers of the 10, SS Panzer Division, and I had conversed with them a lot. During these conversations, I would often compare these Waffen SS soldiers to our regular army men. The fact that our replacements were of lower and lower quality while at the same time, the ranks of the Waffen SS seemed to be filled with expertly trained soldiers, gave me pause. The levels of training and motivation within our division were only a shadow of what they had been back in 1941 during the Africa campaign. Back then, all soldiers had been confident and capable fighters, almost without exception. This kind of vigor could not have been eluded. Even in Tunisia, in 1942, everyone had still been full of conviction. Now, in the year 1944, it appeared to me that most of the time, many were only following orders apathetically. I had to admit that this change of mind had not happened within the ranks of the Waffen SS. During the unfathomably chaotic escape out of the Falaise pocket, soldiers of the Waffen SS showed a level of mutual support and camaraderie that left me utterly impressed. Deep inside, I even envied them for their proudly displayed will to persevere, their still first-rate discipline and, most of all, their internal solidarity. After all these months of turmoil, it seemed quite enticing. But of what use was this perseverance in the face of the sheer superhuman enemy superiority? I was still convinced to be standing on the right side, but last three months' events had not left me unchanged. Events like the July 20 assassination attempt left me thinking, and for a long time I had been contemplating the rationale behind this world war. However, the demand for unconditional surrender, which the Allies had stated during their 1943 Casablanca conference, had left many of us more determined than before, including myself. Should we surrender ourselves to a return to the infamy that the 1920s and 1930s had been for Austria and Germany? To me, this was unacceptable. Better to endure all this fighting to the very end than having to suffer the same way as one's parents. But what would this very end be? How would it look like? I could not know. I tried to talk myself into believing that everything that had been accomplished over the last few years could not have been in vain. In what short moments of respite I got, I always found myself conflicted about these issues. Anyway, when the officers of the 10 SS Panzers asked me to join them, I was indeed tempted to give in to their solicitation. Only after the war would I learn of the war crimes committed by the Waffen SS, not just the General SS and Totenkopf, Death's Head, formations, who were responsible for the genocide happening inside the concentration camps, but fighters of the Waffen SS had just as well incurred a great guilt during their combat operations. Besides, there was another thing, about which I was thinking a lot. During my time with 21, Panzer Division, I had sensed a difference in how I was treated by my superiors. I was under the impression that active duty officers were given many more opportunities to further their career compared to us, reserve officers. While this was certainly not the case in all of the German army, my personal experience in the hard-fought battles of Normandy had led me to believe it personally. Again and again, 
I was assigned special missions, while active duty officers, some of whom had higher ranks, were not burdened that much. This left me disillusioned and somewhat resentful, and it actually convinced me to return to civilian life as soon as possible, right after the war. As Colonel Rauch was now sitting before me and making this offer, all of these thoughts went through my head. As a matter of fact, his sincere and honest approach had impressed me. And in any case, his offer made me resolve for myself to stay true to my division. I hoped that some of the men under my command had made it out of the fillet's pocket, and I wanted to lead them through the horrors of war as good as I could. I simply owed it to my soldiers. Near the end of our conversation, Colonel Rauch eventually shook his head and ended by saying, Well, Huller, I understand, but I ask that you don't take too much time to decide this. In any case, I see a future career officer in you. I will in the near future see to it that you will be assigned to my staff. As soon as replacements from home reach us, you will come to me. For the time being, you stay with I.I. Battalion. Right now, I need every good officer, and as far forward as possible at that. I will also push on with your promotion. If everything goes well, you will be first lieutenant by October fun. Then things will look different again. Also, there's still time after the war to think about your activation. No. He then ordered me to report back with my battalion commander, and with that, I was dismissed. I signed off, leaving the command post without any further comment. Major Lentz had indeed managed to escape with the survivors of our two battalion. I found our unit, or rather what was left of it, without much of a problem. The soldiers were housed very close by. I reported back to Lenz, who was already completely occupied with bringing his unit back into a somewhat battle-ready state. He also looked surprised when he saw me enter. I was tasked by him to assemble and make ready for action a reconnaissance platoon, which was to be held as Bavi, meaning Zur Besonderen Verwendung for special deployment. Its purpose was to give the battalion the most possible freedom of action and also prevent the few men that were left being lost in an unsuspected attack. Once there were only little forces available, good reconnaissance became increasingly valuable. The Major allowed me to choose my men for myself. I just had to make sure we were ready for action. To my great joy, I found one of my self-propelled guns along with its crew. There was much cheering as we greeted each other. I was told that our company had been torn apart in the mayhem of the pocket. The second self-propelled gun had received a direct hit by enemy tank fire and burned up along with its crew. None of them had made it. Other soldiers from my platoon had gone missing in the pocket. With that, this vehicle crew was all that had made it out. A whole five soldiers were left of my anti-tank platoon. There was no trace of 1st Lieutenant Bratz or the other platoons from our 8th Company as well. They were assumed to be either dead or captured. Only some time later did some men of the grenade launcher and anti-air platoons trickle in. They reported that the first lieutenant had most probably been captured during the breakout attempt along with his runner. The two had last been seen reading a sidecar motorcycle. I sincerely hoped he had somehow made it, as he had always been a good superior. Over the last couple of months, we had grown closer through all the hardships we had to share. Upon request to Major Lentz, I received two small French Renault personnel carriers, as well as seven Panzer Grenadier soldiers. Together with my remaining self-propelled gun, my reconnaissance platoon was now complete. Commanding the individual vehicles and their crews were three first-rate NCOs. From now on, I wanted to ride along with the self-propelled gun again. After I had assembled my soldiers, I reported ready for action to Major Lenz. In the meantime, the latter had already rebuilt two Panzer Grenadier companies from those who had escaped the Falaise pocket, along with newly arrived soldiers. These companies still had very little combat power, however, and our II battalion was barely at a strength of 200 men. In the night before August 23, 1944, we marched further east past Bernay. At the time, the danger of getting overturned by rushing Allied troops was omnipresent, and as such, the River Seine appeared to be the only sensible line of defence. In the morning of August 24, new orders reached the division. It was to relocate to the Seine, south of the city of Rouen, without any delay. The area there was to be held as long as possible. In addition, 
Our division was tasked with organizing the orderly crossing over the river of any forces there. Around noon on August 24th, we arrived at Bourteroulde, south of Rouen, where parts of our division were again facing the Allies in battle. Their action was to buy as much time as possible for our own troops to cross the Seine. Also, on August 24th, 1944, French and American forces of the First Army reached Paris. The French capital, along with its Seine bridges, fell into the Liberator's hands almost undamaged on the next day. The French resistance contributed significantly to this, and as such, German resistance inside the city itself was very limited. In the evening of August 24, we finally reached Rouen and the River Seine. Between here and the sea, there was not a single bridge across the river still intact. All of them had been destroyed by repeated Allied air attacks. The only option left were French civilian ferries, a portion of which were operated by the German Kriegsmarine. Around their landing stages, retreating German formations were amassing once more. The Allied menace in the air turned crossing the river into a dangerous endeavour. Panzer Pioneer Battalion 220, 220th Armoured Engineer Battalion, was now tasked with repairing the damaged railroad bridge in Rouen. Our regiment was ordered not to wait, but immediately cross this bridge. As our two battalion was at the tip of the regiment, me and my reconnaissance platoon had to scout the area around our crossing. The railroad bridge was indeed in a severely damaged condition. Heavy bombs had brought it to the brink of collapse. Only a single lane was still negotiable, which was already congested by a multitude of Waffen-SS vehicles that had begun their crossing a while before. During nightfall, we investigated the bridge on foot. One man stayed behind at the bridge's end to serve as a messenger, while me and an NCO boarded a Waffen SS APC and went up to the bridge's midpoint. There we dismounted and got an overview of the situation. The middle part of the bridge had been made somewhat drivable by laying wooden posts and boards across the railroad tracks. Crossing with our vehicles would be a difficult task, but still a feasible one. As long as we guided the vehicles very carefully, it could be done. I sent a man back to report our findings, and as a matter of fact, we managed to cross the bridge with the entirety of Battle Group Rauk. First, we queued up among the seemingly endless columns of Waffen-SS troops, before, long after midnight, and several arduous hours of anxiously feeling forward step by step later, we finally reached the other side. Luckily for us, not a single vehicle got stuck on the bridge, which would have caused a traffic jam and massive delays. Once on the other side, we went eastwards through the streets of Rouen, a city that was by now completely in ruins. Fires were raging everywhere. All these destroyed houses, some of which were utterly ablazi, made for a scene that was as eerie as it was terrifying. We left the city behind us in the black of night, and after a few more hours of driving, we eventually arrived at Beauvais, roughly 35 miles east of Rouen. There, we set up camp in a bushy patch of terrain outside town, before finally falling asleep with much exhaustion. As we would later find out, we had been quite lucky again, as the bridge was ultimately destroyed by an air attack on the very next day. It does not bear contemplating what would have happened if we had been right on the bridge at that moment. Fortune had again favoured us. From Beauvais, our journey went on to Compiègne. Crossing this small town left us all in a contemplative mood. On November 11, 1918, in a railroad car parked in the woods near Compiègne, the armistice which ended World War I had been signed. 22 years later, June 22, 1940, France had signed its formal capitulation to Germany at this very same place. Hitler had arranged it, knowing full well about the location's relevance. Now, four years later, we crossed this important town as an army defeated, and nobody dared to think about how this railroad car might soon be in use again, this time perhaps under the same circumstances as in the fall of 1918. Despite this small village's historic significance, we did not stop or try to look for the railroad car. There was no point in it. We had to get ahead. On the march east, we learned that the Allies in southern France had made rapid progress after their landings. Much like the American and British armies in northern France, they kept on rushing forward. We acknowledged the report with much indifference, 
as we would not have expected for our own forces to stop this advance. All our thoughts were now fixed on Germany and its border. We were convinced that if we managed to reach it, we could halt the Allies there. Rumours were making the rounds that a massive line of fortifications had been constructed at the old German border, which we would be integrated into. In addition, it would be no later than there that the civilian population would welcome us with open arms again. It occurred to none of us that these people might be just as war-weary as we were ourselves. Major Lenz told us that our depleted battle group Rauch was to receive replacements at Reims, roughly 90 miles east of Paris. By August 28, 1944, we had arrived at this area, at all times followed closely by Allied troops. As such, we also did not stay at Reims for long. Allied pressure was simply too much. We were told that our 21 Panzer Division was from now on subject to German Army Group G, a new battle group consisting of two Panzergrenadier battalions, a combat engineer battalion as well as an armoured artillery detachment, was to immediately transfer via Metz into the Nancy area. The units selected for this mission were I Battalion, Panzergrenadier Regiment 192, Feldersatz Bataillon 200, Panzer Pioneer Battalion 220, as well as I Detachment of Panzer Artillery, Regiment 155. Me and my reconnaissance platoon were also assigned to this battle group, much to the chagrin of my battalion commander, who did not want to lose his reconnaissance capabilities again. But orders were orders. Together with my men, I signed off and left Thai Battalion behind. So our journey took us from Rams further into the east. While the Americans took the city already on August 28th, the last parts of our division only crossed the Seine at Rouen, one full day later. We drove by day and night, always spreading out as much as possible. By day, we always looked out for enemy aircraft, which scoured in the sky like wasps searching for rotten fruit. On some occasions, we only managed to disappear in the undergrowth mere moments before a plane passed by. We would also see a new type of aircraft which we had not recognized before. American twin-engine twin-boom fighters called P-38 Lightning. These we soon nicknamed fork-tailed devils. Like the single-engine P-51 Mustang, they had auxiliary fuel tanks enabling them to operate far behind enemy lines on the ground. And this they did with much success, as evidenced by the many burnt-out vehicles we were passing on our route. Many of these wrecks had charred corpses still inside them. No one had the time to bury the dead. We avoided the main lines of movement, opting for side roads as much as was feasible. Getting enough supply of fuel worked surprisingly well on our march. Only ammunition was short. On August 30th, 1944, we passed Verdun and drove further towards Nancy. There we could again see increased activity by the French resistance movement. We learned that there had been multiple attacks on our communication lines over the days before. Most of all, our forces had been raided by the Résistance in the vicinity of Luneville. After that, Waffen-SS units had combed the area, but failed to score any success against the French. We spent the night in a village, and in the morning, we found the streets littered with three-pointed forged metal caltrops. Colonel Rauch had a discussion with the mayor, and within an hour, the caltrops were gone again. It was obvious that the local population feared reprisals from our side. To ward off bad surprises, we kept up full combat readiness on our march. We did not want to risk running into an ambush. By the first days of September, we stood in the area north of Epinal, a town roughly 90 miles southwest of Strasbourg. This meant that we were not far from Germany, as Strasbourg can be considered a border city. By now, Allied troops had already reached the Belgian capital of Brussels. Our 21 Panzer Division was in an extremely poor condition. A report issued by the division staff estimated that the division was down to a strength between 6,000 and 8,000 men. More accurate assessments could not be made, as individual units and formations had been forced back on their retreat as far as Aachen. There were no tanks that could still be reported as operational, only one or two Sturmgeschütze, assault guns, as well as a few AA guns and artillery pieces. Nothing more than that. In Alsace-Lorraine, we turned back west again for the first time in a while. Our battle group received orders to immediately reconnoitre from Nancy along the Moselle River in the direction of Epinal, 
and determine whether the enemy had already crossed the Moselle. Following that, we were to secure the area and thus create the prerequisites for a planned five. Panzer Armee attack westward. Beginning September 5, 1944, we commenced feeling our way forward from our starting point south of Nancy, going further south. The first few days passed by without enemy contact. In the windows of the villages we passed, however, were at all times scared faces staring at us. Some streets had already been solemnly decorated, obviously in anticipation of the arrival of the Americans. Most French had not expected to now witness German forces driving through their home village again. We ignored the whole situation, passing through with a stone still and grim expression. In the village of Châtel sur Moselle, north of Epinal, we halted and made camp. Here, too, the streets were decorated with flower bouquets. As we billeted ourselves in a barn, the locals told us, once being asked, and only after some hesitation, that a few hours before an American scouting patrol had entered the village. They had already withdrawn westward again, however. After leaving Châtel sur Moselle the next day, we turned westward ourselves and cautiously drove towards the surmised American spearheads. On September 8th, we arrived at Miracourt, roughly 13 miles west of Châtel sur Moselle. It was here that we would again come into contact with Allied troops. This contact did not come as a surprise, as we were on the alert. The local civilians' reports about the approaching Americans made us proceed with extraordinary caution. Before entering a new village, we would first observe it from a safe distance. In addition, we always tried to allocate forces to our direct support. This effort would pay off at Mayacourt, as shortly before we would have entered town, we spotted an American M8 Greyhound armoured scout car covering a street. Its 37mm main gun, as well as its heavy 50 machine gun, posed a serious threat. As such, this threat had to be neutralised as soon as possible. We slowly drove our self-propelled gun into a favourable shooting position. Everyone's nerves were extremely strained, but still, they all did their part with great zeal. Now we finally had a chance to strike back. In a village house's backyard, we found a good position to engage at around 1,000 feet. The enemy scout car was well camouflaged and covered by a small wall up to the height of its turret ring. Hitting it in such a position would be difficult. The American himself, on the other hand, could not get a beard on us. This we could see by how far his gun was elevated. It was a standoff. I now sent one of my runners to one of my trucks, ordering the latter to roll forward on the road slowly and for all to see. When that truck arrived, prudently, with only the lone driver inside, my plan came to fruition. The Americans at once took our bait, and as the armoured scout car slowly went forward to open fire on the truck, I shouted, Fire! With a loud bang, our shell left the barrel, striking the armoured car at the rear. Smoke emerged. I ordered an explosive shell be loaded and fired at will. The scout car was still able to move under its own power, however, hastily rolling back behind a group of bushes. Our second shot missed. To us it was now as clear as day. Soon we would come under artillery fire or be hunted by fighter bombers. Things we did not want to find ourselves in. As such, I gave the order to withdraw, and we leapfrogged back behind the next ridge. We quickly covered several miles until arriving at Shams, a town at the Moselle River. Here too, were decorated streets and people looking at us anxiously. The fact that we had engaged the American vanguard without any casualties made us euphoric. Happily waving at the surprised French, we crossed the town at maximum speed. Once arrived at battalion command, I gave my report, which was acknowledged without any further measures taken. Our side had too few troops available to do anything meaningful. In all likelihood, the Moselle's crossings would soon fall into American hands. Merely part of our 16th Infantry Division were strewn across multiple bases in the area. Between their positions, however, were none of our forces. By September 10, 1944, the Allies pushed their troops forward again. To this end, German Panzer Brigade 112, with its Panzer Fee Panther and Panzer IV tanks, were now to conduct a first limited attack into the area west of Epinal. Our battle group was also assigned to this unit for the duration of the attack. Since Colonel Rauch had fallen ill, Colonel von Luck, regimental commander of Panzergrenadier, 
Regiment 125, took over command of the now called Battlegroup von Luck. It was further reinforced by an N2I battalion of the 125th Panzer Grenadiers. The planned attack west of Epinal ended in catastrophe. When the Americans and French of 15th Army Corps identified our staging areas west of Domper and Epinal, as well as detecting the beginning advance of 112th Brigade's brand new German panzers, they lost no time. On September 13th, they destroyed a total of almost 70 German tanks with concentrated air attacks and artillery fire. As a result, 112th Panzer Brigade's attack was already over before it had started at all. Our battle group was now to conduct a limited counterattack to cover the retreat of the remains of the brigade. Thus, we advanced from Epinal in the direction of Domper. There was a fierce meeting engagement with the tanks of French 2nd Armoured Division, which were themselves advancing from the Darni area. On September 12th already, the French had crossed the Moselles at Shams. We were now drawn back towards Epinal. These engagements left us at a total strength of only 600 to 700 men and a few guns. Going in an arc over Rambavillas, we transferred northward towards Luneville. Now the plan was for German forces to establish a defensive line along the river Murthe. The Americans were faster, however, taking Luneville on September 16, 1944, along with its Murthe crossings. This meant another change of plans for the Wehrmacht. After the catastrophic failure of Panzer Brigade 112, west of Epinal, Army Group G ordered another attack. This wish was not to be denied. The conditions for this planned offensive just became more and more difficult, however. Again, consolidated elements of our 21st Panzer Division and Brigade 112, now called Battle Group Feuchtinger, were to advance along with Panzer Brigades 111 and 113, as well as remains of 15th Panzer Grenadier Division from the Baccarat area in the direction of Luneville. In the night before September 17, 1944, we readied ourselves for this attack. On the ride to our staging area, I had a rare exhilarating experience for a change. As we went through a village, a cow suddenly ran on the street right in front of our vehicle. I sat in the first of our two Renault trucks, when in the blink of an eye this cow came out from behind a bush standing right in our vehicle's way. My driver could not brake in time, such that we rammed the animal at full tilt. The poor cow was hurled on top of our hood by the impact, from which it slid down again once we had come to a halt, mooing loudly. Without serious injury, the animal trotted off. We were as startled as we were dumbfounded. I did not want to leave a bad impression. After all, I was quite aware that, especially in rural areas like this, Losing a single cow could end in a family having to starve. We were somewhat ahead of the others, so me and the driver spontaneously went to the close by farmstead. I was intent on offering the French farmer my apologies for our accident with the cow. In the stead's yard, there was a little girl staring at us with a start, and a moment later, the farmer himself came running toward us, gesturing loudly. He was obviously fearing for his child, as he knelt down and embraced the girl tightly, scowling at us. He then slowly pushed the child behind his own body. I now attempted to explain to him that we had possibly hurt one of his cows, but to no avail. My French was obviously bad, and after the first few sentences, the farmer apparently believed we had come to appropriate his car. When he opened the barn doors and showed us the car without being asked to, we realized that we could not hope to communicate. We gestured to make him understand that everything was fine, and closing with the words, Pardon? La vache? Apologies. The cow. We took to our heels. We left behind a more than confused French farmer, who was probably happy to be still in possession of his vehicle, and who almost certainly had no clue what cow these two Germans had been talking about. In the morning of September 18th, our attack commenced according to plan, and indeed, we made swift progress until noon. When we crossed through Baccarat in the direction of Luneville, however, Allied P-38 Lightning Fighters spotted us and swooped down on us. Their attack only took seconds to manifest. We had not heard the aircraft on their approach due to the noise of our own engines, and our air observers could not spot them in time. When they turned to face us and closed in, it was already too late. We saw muzzle flashes below the enemy two engine craft's cockpits, and a moment later small fountains of dirt were racing towards us. I was still with one of my trucks, 
whose driver was quick-witted enough to steer the Renault into a small patch of brushwork, we jumped off the vehicle and pressed ourselves into the road ditch. All were now expecting bombs to explode, but none of that happened. The fighters circled us for several more times before flying off again. I gave the order to mount up again and find out whether there had been casualties. After a few minutes, I received a dire report. The chief gunner of my self-propelled gun had fallen victim to one of the enemy fighter's salvos. After spotting the aircraft, the entire crew had reacted correctly, but the sergeant had been just a moment too slow and jumped right into a burst of fire. He had died on the spot. I despondently acknowledged the news and made the men mount up again. Once more, death had come to haunt us, and like most times, it had come surprisingly and without warning. I secured the right flank with my reconnaissance platoon, and we advanced from Baccarat in a northwestern direction without further incidents. We first crossed the river Murt, and by evening we already stood at Zermanenil, south of Luneville. Here, protected by the village, we halted for the time being. But the pressure exerted by the Americans to our north and the French further west became more and more intense. In the morning of September 19th, 1944, the fortunes of war turned against us. The Allies launched a counterattack. To this end, American units had taken up elevated positions at Luneville the night before, such that by dawn, we found that they had direct sight of our own position. Single American tanks were now firing shell upon shell into the area they could overlook. We were trapped. As soon as one of our vehicles showed itself, it became the target of intense fire. We attempted identifying the enemy tanks and opening fire ourselves. This worked to some degree, although we could not hope to get out more than three to five inaccurate and hastily fired shells. Nobody wanted to make themselves seen by enemy spotters for too long. We knew all too well that the American tanks' gunners were only waiting for us to show up. Every time our shots were detected immediately and followed by intense counterfire, we rapidly switched to a new position and tried again from there. The same result. Over the course of several hours, shells kept striking around us in irregular intervals. We never had the chance to score an exact hit. One Panzer V, Panther tank of Panzer Brigade 112, tried to change position and failed to avoid the area visible to the enemy. When it closed in on a road junction that had come under fire multiple times, each of us expected the tank to be hit directly. All of a sudden, a young panzer grenadier jumped out of the roadside ditch, stood up in the middle of the road, and put up his arms right in front of the lumbering vehicle. The tank's driver stepped on the brakes, such that the whole vehicle tilted slightly forward from the abrupt deceleration. A second later, the brave infantryman was already gone again followed immediately by the staggering detonation of an enemy anti-tank projectile right in the middle of the junction. The Panther's commander, realizing the impending danger, slowly backed up into the protection of nearby houses. There was no getting forward here. The entire area was visible to our enemy. Further in the front around Mortagne, Allied pressure became overbearing, and in the evening we eventually received the order to withdraw. To this end, the armoured units of Panzer Brigade 112 diverted into the woods south of Luneville. Driving from cover to cover, we followed them. During our departure, we had yet another lucky moment, the hours before I had spent with my self-propelled gun, to which we had hooked on a small trailer that we used to stow equipment, but also ammunition. We had procured this trailer only a short time earlier. When we turned around a house corner and crossed the road at full speed, an explosion tore apart our trailer right behind our backs. An enemy shell had missed us just by a fraction of a second and hit the trailer. Apart from the hitch, nothing was left of it. We found that, in light of us all surviving this incident, it was an acceptable loss. Finally, during nightfall, we were able to escape over a meadowland. In the night before September 20th, 1944, we withdrew further back. In the dark of night, we managed to go back across the river Murtha by a very narrow margin. While wading through the water, we suddenly sank into a deep hole and ended up with the vehicle's hood underwater. In the pitch black, we feared for a moment to sink entirely. But much to our luck, we remained half above the waterline and only the engine had stalled. 
we managed to win over the commander of a panther tank that was also fording the river. Underwater, we fixed two steel cables to our self-propelled gun, and after a single hitch, we were free again. The panther continued towing us until we entered a nearby forest, where we spent the entire rest of the night getting the engine to run again. Finally, as the sun was about to rise, we did it. The engine started. The panther tank that had taken us out of that wet mess had been one of only a few of 112th Brigade's panzers to successfully cross the Murtha. Apart from them, the brigade had to leave behind almost its entire remaining vehicle inventory. We hastily formed a defensive line along the Murth between Luneville and Baccarat. In essence, this meant that we initially secured possible river crossings. My two Renault trucks had also made it across the river, and after repairing our self-propelled gun, we joined the mass of withdrawing units on the way back to Baccarat. Once again, we had suffered losses in battle, and of the almost 700 soldiers of the former battlegroup Rauch, only half of that number were still capable of fighting. With all that, the counterattack had ultimately failed. The front lines now hardened into a gentle arc from Luneville over Baccarat to Rambovillas and Epinal. To our benefit, the Americans and French had to first reorganize their forces, and things were somewhat calm for a moment. Before Colonel Rauch had transferred command to Colonel von Luck, there had been one final conversation between us, in which he had also announced that he was to give up command due to illness. Still, he wanted to stay true to his words, and thus told me that after the conclusion of our attack, I was to be assigned adjutant to the commander of his armed battalion, Captain Werner Reitzer. I was to stay with Reitzer until Rauch's return and a reassignment into the regimental staff envisioned for me. Rauch also let me know he had arranged for me to become an active officer. In case I had any objections against that, I would still be able to change my mind at the end of the war. Since the failed attacks at Apinal and Luneville were now over, I reported to Iron Battalion, Panzergrenadier Regiment 192, on September 21st. My reconnaissance platoon was disbanded and integrated into the battalion. With that, I had no more direct subordinates to command. One last time I talked to my men, wished them all the best, and that they would come home in good health. To King our farewells really was hard for us all. Too long had we been serving close together. Counting myself, only five were still remaining. Not more. The rest were either dead, missing, or had been captured. It would only be a matter of time until I would meet such a fate as well.